Good morning and welcome back to The Breakfast Buzz, everyone. We've covered four different groups of insect pollinators, and so today we are going to cover a fifth known as Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera include butterflies and moths. So the plan is today to talk a little bit about the importance of butterflies and moths. Butterflies and moths have a couple of key reasons that they're really important to our ecosystems and to our environment. And so I'm going to talk about that, talk about how we can support them in our own landscapes, and some different ways to identify them, and reasons that we can appreciate them even more than we already do. So we see a lot of butterflies, or we seem to notice them a little bit more, and we seem to talk about them a little bit more, hear about them a little bit more than moths. And so I want to talk a little bit about you know, how important moths are and really shed some light on why they're actually pretty great. Butterflies and moths together make up about 12,000 Lepidoptera species, but only about 800 of those species are butterflies. And so you, know, you think of the moths that we might see occasionally here and there, but in North America we have over 10,000 species of moths. Butterflies tend to get a lot of attention. They're considered to be more colorful, more showy than moths. Uh, they're also considered to be the daytime flyers, whereas moths are considered to be the nighttime flyers. But of course, as is often the case in nature, there are always exceptions to these rules. In case in point, here we have one of those very exceptions. The characteristics that I just listed are almost all out the window with this little moth species. It's a type of clear wing moth. Uh, as you can see, it's flying during the daytime and it is very colorful. What are some of the ways that we can identify butterflies apart from moths, or distinguish the two from each other. If you can look at them up close, you can see some traits that uh, distinguish them from each other, such as their antenna, or the way that they hold their wings when they are at rest. Um, with their antenna, you know, with moths, you actually, with the males, you will see more of a feathery sort of appearance to their antenna. If you look up close, it's actually quite beautiful. And for the female moths, their antenna will kind of just draw to a point at the end. In the case of butterflies with their antenna, you have some variations, but primarily what you'll see with them is they're gonna have a club or kind of like a, a nodule at the end of their antenna. And so it'll either be pretty much in the shape of a club or something, you know, in the case of skipper butterflies, you'll see a hooked club at the end of their antenna. When butterflies are at rest or you see them visiting a flower, They'll usually hold their wings either partially open or they will be closed vertically. Uh, Xerces Society likens it to uh, like a little sail on a sailboat. With moths, you'll see them holding their wings flat with their forewings covering their hind wings. So let's talk a little bit about their feeding habits. Adult butterflies feed on nectar and as far as pollination services go, they are like a number of our other beneficial insects that we've talked about and other insect pollinators that they're accidentally shifting pollen from one flower to the next just because they happen to pick up a little bit as they're going after the nectar. Many adult moths of the over 10,000 species that exist in North America are important specialist pollinators, which means that they're essential to the pollination and reproduction of particular plants. But as is the case with butterflies, the adult moths are also only just coincidentally shifting pollen from one flower to the next. So what else makes moths and butterflies so necessary to our ecosystems and so beneficial to our environment besides their coincidental pollination services? To cover that information, we will talk about the feeding habits of caterpillars. They're young. In the case of butterflies, they will actually lay their eggs on specific plants or flowers and their caterpillars will feed on that plant. Moth caterpillars will actually feed on a slightly larger range of food than just plants. Moths may actually require specific host plants for their young, but a few also eat seeds or other organic matter. Less than 1% eat your clothes, like wool and silk. 
another fun fact about adult moths is that many of them don't even have functional mouth parts or digestive tracts in their adult phase of their life and so they don't actually eat anything. Since most other insect pollinators are inactive at night, this makes moths pretty spectacularly important for the pollination of species of nighttime blooming plants. So talking about the other ways that they're important, we've talked a little bit about caterpillars and host plants for caterpillars and how butterflies and moths will lay their eggs on particular plants. One of the equally important things about the existence of moths and butterflies and their caterpillars is that of the larger food web and how they support it particularly in the case of things like songbirds. Their caterpillars are big time bird food. And according to the research of Doug Tallamy, for anybody who's read any of his books like Bring Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope, his research shows again and again that caterpillars are the main food source of most North American birds, particularly when they are rearing their young. So that brings me back to the discussion of host plants and why it's important to have these host plants so that butterflies and moths will have their preferred food source for their young and will actually lay their eggs on that and then their young will be able to develop. Across my Breakfast Buzz videos, I keep mentioning different ways to support insect pollinators and one of the number one things that I keep throwing out there is that we need to be using native plants to our eco-regions. There's a lot of research and there's a lot of reasoning behind this and not all native plants are created equal. Some plants like oaks have a huge amount of benefit, you know, as far as being host plants for a ton of Lepidoptera species. And so an oak tree is going to provide more than maybe something like a tulip tree or a black gum, but still black gums and tulip trees have their benefit as well. And put it at its most basic, these plants, these native plants, have evolved alongside of these insect pollinators. And they have evolved to attract particular insect pollinators and to be eaten by particular insect pollinators. And these two things have evolved alongside of each other, as have our, all of our wildlife. Our wildlife, like songbirds, have evolved to feed their young and also eat caterpillars to sustain themselves and the more that we provide this in our landscapes the more that they will thrive as well. So having something like a butterfly garden or maybe even a moth garden if you want to go that route in your own home landscape is going to provide particular benefit to these insects especially if you're providing host plants that their young will feed on and then you will attract their young, their caterpillars, and subsequently you will also attract the songbirds to eat them and also will be feeding them to their young. A really great example of something that requires a particular host plant is the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly, uh, as an adult, feeds on different nectar sources like blazing star and a number of different flowers, but its young requires milkweed caterpillars of the monarch butterfly are not going to be palatable to birds around here because they are toxic to the birds around here because of feeding on milkweed. That said, there are a lot of other things that feed on monarch caterpillars in our ecosystems that also support birds. So the more that we plant something like milkweed in our yards, which I actually have behind me, I'm not sure if you can see the pink flowers, Um, the more that we have different types of milkweed that are native to our area, that we will be providing more benefit and more of a place and space for them to reproduce because that is their larva's food source. So I am looking around my yard right now to see if I can find any monarch caterpillar eggs. And I am looking at a rogue swamp milkweed that came up in the middle of my yard and there are a bunch of eggs on here. You can see them kind of littering this leaf. And other leaves on this plant. We've got one here somewhere. There's another one. 
and so all you need to do is just kind of gently turn over you know I usually like to like just gently nudge the stem to look on the undersides of leaves but this is where the monarch butterflies will lay their eggs it's on the undersides of leaves right now I am investigating a spice bush to see if there are any spice bush swallowtail caterpillars hanging out on this shrub the spice bush is actually not the only host plant for the spice bush swallowtail, but uh, I would expect to see some hanging out on the undersides of these leaves or furled up in the leaves. And unfortunately, I am not seeing any yet at this time. So uh, they might be somewhere where I can't quite get to them, but um, this is kind of what you do if you want to scout and look for these bugs to see if they're in your garden. We also need to make sure that we're providing a nectar source through the growing season for the adult butterflies, the monarch, as well as other butterflies. As far as plants for monarch butterflies to get nectar from as adults, Liatris or blazing stars are generally pretty reliable species of plants uh, around here to attract them. Something to note too about Liatris plants or the Atris species is that they also attract a lot of other pollinators. Here we have an Eastern Tiger Swallowtail feeding on some purple coneflower. And these also have their own set of host plants that they lay their eggs on and require as well. Luckily, there is a lot of helpful information out there about host plants and creating butterfly gardens so that we can attract these little lovelies to our yard and support them the best that we can. You might not be able to as easily find information about moths and their host plants online the way that you can for butterflies, but that information is available too. Looking into different field guides for butterflies or moths of North America or more locally like to Illinois or the Midwest, looking at field guides like that will also be tremendously helpful for finding what host plants you need to have in your yard to support different Lepidoptera species. One of my favorite resources, in addition to field guides for creating butterfly and moth gardens, is to look at Grow Natives website because they have top 10 lists for creation of different types of gardens, including butterfly gardens and moth gardens. So shout out to Grow Native for their website and resources. As far as what we can do to provide the best habitat for these insects, I really want to drive home the point that we really need their host plants and we need a nectar source for them through the growing season. So those two things are really important. And again, staying away from insecticides. Many butterflies are actually weak flyers and having shelter from the wind can be a really beneficial thing for them. So you can create something like that just in the form of plants or rocks with crevices, things like that. Butterflies take advantage of the sun to warm themselves for their flight and so Having some south or southwest facing rocks can actually be a really good way for them to have a space to sun themselves. Also making sure that you're leaving some dormant growth, you know, spent vegetation through the winter time and into the spring because a lot of butterflies and moths will actually overwinter as an egg, as a caterpillar, or as a pupa. And so having places for them to take shelter from the inclement weather and allowing them to be there into the springtime and into the summer is going to be really helpful in supporting them. So I thank you once again for joining me on this edition of The Breakfast Buzz and I hope that these videos have helped you to learn a little bit more about our insect pollinators, how important they are, and all of the different benefits that they provide besides pollination services and I hope that this has also helped you to learn how to incorporate some practices into your own landscape so that you can support them as well. There's a lot of information out there right now telling us how bad things are and I think that it is a sense of joy and empowerment to know that there is something that I can do personally on a smaller scale to be part of the solution. So I would encourage you to do the same and to take a little bit of pride and joy in watching once you've planted some native plants and incorporate some of these practices that year after year you're going to see more activity with all of these little creatures in your yard. So with that I'm signing off. Thank you for joining me on the Breakfast Buzz once again and 
all of you be safe out there.